Before I begin, can you turn to somebody next to you and behind you and say this, all right? You can be a cell leader. Amen. I like that conviction. I hear rumbling across you know, the, the auditorium and uh, you are convinced that you can be a cell leader. I did not say that you will become one. I said you can be one. All right? And uh, so this is our, what we call the annual reminder. A reminder to us why we are what we are. And uh, this is my 20th year serving in UMC as a pastor. So 20 long years. As I look back in the 20 years, Oh, thank you. I didn't know I deserve a clap. It's 20 years, right? But 20 years is like a twinkling of an eye. I'm here. I still remember when I joined UMC uh, as a full-time staff. You know, the church were only about 200 people. And there were only two other staff, which is our sister Chen Geng, who is the secretary of the church, and our sister Gole Suan, who is the youth worker in the church. So I was the only guy you know, in, in, uh, in Dabansara Utama uh, office, and quite a lonely job, you know, being the only guy and all that. And we started with something like 200 members. But it is an amazing journey for me personally. Pastor Daniel joined two years later, but I was employed in 1994 after, you know, being uh, in the workforce for about nine years as an electrical engineer. I joined, the work, uh, I joined a full-time work in the church and uh, employed as a, what we call then a care group director. So my job is just direct, okay? And we were transitioning from transitioning into a cell church. And when I joined uh, church as a full-time staff, I wasn't too clear what this cell church thing is all about, but we knew in our heart, in our spirit, that it was God's call. And the eldership during that time, I wasn't an elder then, but during that time, the eldership felt that this is something that God has called them into. And I remember I was employed and I was told that now you're full-time staff, now you go to Singapore every year for the cell church conference. So for five years, every year, I went down to Singapore for the Cell Church Conference. I went there, I took the, the teaching bank, and I started directing people, learn something new again, until it ran out of Cell Church Conference. There's no more Cell Church Conference. And then we, I, I read a lot of books, you know, and uh, begin to learn something about the Cell Church. But what is phenomenal is that after 20 years, uh, we just grew and grew and grew. Now. And from 200, now today, of course, we're hitting something like 4,000 if you add up all the uh, congregation together. And it is an amazing journey. I would never have dreamed of you know, speaking in a church of this size. Uh, it is really God's grace and God's mercy over our lives. I think we all can be thankful, amen? Thankful for the fact that, you know, yeah, give the Lord a clap. We can be thankful that, you know, God has used the cell church to help us grow. Of course, it's not the only thing. And Pastor Daniel reminded us that it is the move of the Holy Spirit. And I think the cell church was a very powerful vehicle that God began to use. Now, do you know that for many of us, for many churches, in fact, churches all around the world, I think churches have very big, wide open door. We are very friendly, right? I, I, Christians, are, I think we are the happiest people in the world, right? So we are the friendliest people, the happiest people in the world. We should be, right? And we are, welcome, we are very welcoming to, uh, to visitors. So every church, I believe, in the world welcomes a lot of visitors. In fact, hundreds of visitors walk into a church and, and uh, maybe even thousands walk into a church in a single year. New, new people, that is, or are unbeliever. But yet, why is it that for many churches, although you have so many visitors, yet the church don't really grow phenomenally? I think this, the, the answer to that is that although the church is a big front door, they also have a big back door. Right? People come in, people go out, people come in, people go out. And the net effect is that you don't really grow. And so, really, if you think about it, the key to church growth, I think one of the many keys, are, but I think the main key is how do you close the back door? Because there are many visitors. So if you can close the back door, or you can't close it completely, but at least narrow the back door, then you can prevent people from going out, right, in a, in a good way. Prevent, right, in a good way. So how do you prevent people from getting out of the church? All right, think about that one. Is it good programs? Is it good worship? They are important, by the way. Good preaching? I think at the end of the day, if you are, were to ask people here, people who have been here for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you ask them this question, why are you still in the UMC? And, and why am I still in the UMC? 
Let me tell you that the, the one key reason why I am in UMC is because of relationships. Because of the people I've grown to love over the years. Uh, of the kids, I've seen them grow over the years. I love them and begin to see God using them in a powerful way. And I'm so glad to be part of UMC. Why? Because of relationships. And I believe that relationship closes or rather narrow the back door. So if we can narrow the back door, there are many visitors who come, they will remain. Why? Because of relationships. That to me is a key. And do you know that God values relationships? In fact, the whole Christian faith is about relationship, a relationship with this God, and therefore He called us as a community to have a relationship with one another. And that is why it is a call this weekend here that everyone must belong to a cell group because relationships happen or take place in a cell group. It's a simple strategy. And Pastor Daniel has already made a call. Everyone should be and must be in a cell group if you choose to belong in the UMC. Okay? And that is the essence of a cell church. What makes us different from any other church is this, that cell group is not one of the many options that you choose. Cell group is the only option as a starting option that you must choose if you want to belong to this church. Pastor Daniel candidly say that if you want to get married, you have to be part of a cell. If you want to get, what else do you need to do? All right, go on a mission trip? You want to serve in this church? Maybe die no need. Lah, right? So the point here, I hope you get that point now. You know, the part of preaching is that we comfort the disturbed, right? I mean, you, you come here very disturbed in your heart. We pray that, you know, in the worship, in the in the preaching of God's Word, you will be comforted. But do you know that part of preaching is also to disturb the comfortable? If you are too comfortable here, pardon us if we disturb you. So this, if, this weekend here, I want to disturb you. I want to disturb you by saying to you that if you are not in a cell group, you should be in one and you should feel very uncomfortable right now. So will you forgive me for that? Because this is a cell church weekend. So this is what I want all of us to do. Now, those of you who are in a cell group right now, can you please stand with me? In a cell group. Can you stand right now? If you are not sure, then you don't stand, eh? Because you are not really in a cell group, all right? Okay? So, pardon me for just a short while. So those of you who are in a cell group, you stand. If you are not, you remain seated, okay? Now, this is what I want the ushers to do right now. Ushers, can you very quickly bring take that card and just pass on to those who are seated, all right? Can you quickly do that? All right, those of you who are standing who belong to the cell group, if you find that people who are seated around you have not got that card, can you just make sure, wave your hand at the ushers and make sure uh, they get a card? Can you do that very, very quickly right now? Now, while this is happening, Outside at our concourse, we have set up, the connectors have set up a showcase, a showcase of the events or what's happening in our cell groups. Uh, I, have, I took a look at it and said, wow, there's a lot of life. There's a lot of life in cell groups. So what I want you to do, all right, for those of you who are not in any cell group at all, can you take this opportunity at the end of, of the celebration, go out there to the concourse, have a look all right, at the cell group showcase to see the kind of activity that's happening among uh, the cell group uh, members here, okay? Make sure everyone has, has a card. All right, then you sit down right now, everyone. Thank you very much. Now, what I want you to do, those of you who have a card in your hand right now, now, this is my plea or my plea uh, to you. Can you try a cell group? At least make a try, all right? Can I urge you to try at least two or three times? Make a, take a go and go to a cell group. Now, by the way, one other way we can connect you is that you fill in the details in that card. At the end of the celebration, all right, pass it on to the usher or go up to the connector's booth and say, this is my card. All right, help me find a cell group. And then give it a try. Go there. And my job this morning is to convince you that you should join a cell group. All right, that's my job. And so by the end of this celebration, the success of my preaching would be that you're excited about taking this card uh, and give it to an usher. You're excited about taking this card and pass it to a connector in the concourse. Is that okay? All right, so for those of you who are not in a cell group, I'm talking to you. Those of you who are in a cell group, I'm reminding you what cell, the, cell whole, the cell strategy is all about. Now, our vision in UMC 
is building God's community and making His glory known. Now, I, th- I personally think that every church needs to have this vision. Building God's community, that means building up the people of God and making known His glory is basically about evangelism, making known God all right, outside in the world. So building up and going out, that is the two key thing of what all church should be. And so our vision says that to build God's community and to make known His glory. So everything that we do in this church here must fulfill this vision. So the key issue we need to ask is this, is the South Church platform a great platform to fulfill the vision of the church? So we need to ask that question over and over again and every year we remind ourselves. So a great question to start with right now is this, what is a church? Because if we can answer this question, what is a church? Then we begin to understand why we do what we do. And then we get involved in what the leadership of this church is pointing you towards. So what is a church? Now some of you here have heard this story when you were a young kid. The story of six blind men and an elephant. Have you heard that story before? I'm sure you have, right? And uh, these six blind men here have often heard about, one, about an elephant. People have described to them what an elephant is, but they have never obviously seen an elephant because they are blind. But they wanted to feel what an elephant is like. And so a friend took them to a zoo, got a permission from the zookeeper. Can my friends, six of them, go to an elephant and try to feel what an elephant is? So if you know the story, the first man went to the body of the elephant, touched the elephant, and told everybody, told his five other friends, hey, the elephant is like a big wall. And then the second man said, who was touching the trunk of the elephant, and he said, no, no, you are wrong. The elephant is actually like a spear. And the third man who is holding the trunk of the elephant, a big wobbly in the trunk, and he said, no, the two of you are wrong. The elephant is actually like a big snake. And the fourth person, you know, no, no, all of you are wrong. He was holding to the trunk, I mean, sorry, the, the leg of the elephant, and he was holding it like this, and he said, the elephant is like a tree trunk. And the fifth blind man was holding, you know, the ear of the elephant, and he said, all of you are wrong. The elephant is like a big fan. And the final blind man, the last blind man says, no, 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 all of you are wrong. Because he was touching the tail of the elephant. He said, no, an elephant is like a rope. Now, who is right here? Who is right? In some sense, all of them are right. But they are not totally right. Because they they are only seeing a perspective of what an elephant is. Now, the same can happen for those of us of the understanding of what a church is. Do you know we can look at one aspect of the church and not understand the church in totality? Right? How, what, how do you get your perspective? Or how do people get their idea of church from? For example, some of you get the idea of a church from your past experiences, whether positively or negatively. Some of you come, from, come with the idea uh, because you have been to a church before when you were younger, or you come from a mission school, you come with this nostalgic idea that the church uh, must have a steeple and a cross. So you come to DMC and say, this is not a church, right? And so you have this nostalgic idea that the church must have wooden benches. So you look at this soft, comfortable chair, you say, this is not a church. So we come with different ideas, and we will begin to sing some fast, upbeat music, right? You say, this is not church, because in church we sing hymns. Right? So can you imagine that we come with all this kind of perspective and we say church cannot be any other way except my way. That's one perspective. And some other people get the idea of a church from what I call pop culture. Pop culture means you look at movies like Da Vinci Code. Oh, you have an idea of what church is. You know? Or you watch a lot of Korean drama. And the idea of church where you get married in. So you have this, this church must be white in color. So you walk in the dream center and say, this is not church. Because you have this idea that you know, it's a wedding hall. And for some, it could be a funeral hall that you've been to before. Like. And uh, even Mr. Bean, by the way, when you watch Mr. Bean, eh, it gives you an idea what church is in it. What does Mr. Bean say about church? Boring, you know. And so we, pop culture influences the way we think about church. Now, another way that people get the idea from, of church is from the media. 
And whether it's printed media, social media, you know, generally the media are not very sympathetic towards church, isn't it? And uh, they are not generally positive because they, you, they always, most of the time anyway, they report about scandals. And just because of one scandal, the whole, every, every other church uh, is marked in some sense. And, and media would do that, why? Because it draws readers. And therefore, their reporting of a church has not been very, very nice. Churches does a lot of good things, amen? We do a lot of that, but we don't showcase it so often. Why? Because you do not want to boast about the good we do. But unfortunately, the media does not pick that up. So in, in many people's mind who have no idea of what a church is, they think that church is not so good. That's sad. Other people got the idea of a church from a projection of their own personal needs and preferences. You know, you come to church because of something that the church can do for you. That's why you come. And uh, so there are many analogies to what a church is when you come with that need. For example, let me give an example here. A church is like a concert. People come to church because they enjoy the, uh, what's happening up here on the stage. And it's very uplifting, and you have positive feeling about, about being here, and you're satisfied by the performance. And that is why you keep coming back to church here, because it's like a concert. But I tell you what, the church is not like a concert. In what ways is it not like, like, like a concert? In a concert, you are the audience, right? And the performers are all up here. Do you know in a church, who is the audience? You are the audience. Who is, all right? And who, sorry, you, you are the performer, sorry. Who is the audience? God is the audience. God is watching you. That is why the church is not like a concert. Now, how do you know whether, which idea do you carry? When you leave this place this morning, people would ask you, how is church? If your only answer is, wow, it was a great, great celebration, I had a great time, the, the preacher was good, I hope so, like, you know, and, and the worship leader is really good, and I had a great time. Uh, that's a concept. You know what's the right question? The right question should be, all right, how does God feel about you huh? after the celebration? Now, when you begin to ask that question, it's no longer a concert because you are the performer and God is right now watching all of us, the performance of your life. That is why, unlike a concert, we are the performer. For some, the church is like a school. That is why even in the Chinese, Chinese word for church, it's actually jiao tang or jiao hui. The word jiao means to teach. And uh, so we come here because we want to have good religious and moral education. But do you know that the church is more than the school? Because we are not only training the mind, we want to train the heart. So that one year from now, five years from now, ten years from now, when, when your friends look at you, when your family look at you, you are not just trained in the head, you know. You are trained in the heart. We are not looking for educated minds only. We are looking for transformed hearts. And that is why it is more than a school in some sense, because our general idea of school is that we go there, get that paper. That is the number one idea. But, so unlike a school, we don't pass academic exam. We pass what we call life exam. So people look at a church like a concert, like a school. There's another way people look at church. Church is like a club. We pay our dues, we come here, we enjoy all the facilities in a club. And therefore, we come here, we love the cafe, you know. We love the free Wi-Fi. And we love the library for some of us. We love the sports center when, when it was still available. And we are looking forward to phase two when there, there will be not, not good, better sports facilities maybe. And therefore, membership, in some sense, is like a privilege for us. Now, what, how is the church different from a club? It's different in the sense that in a club, we serve the members. Eh? But in a church, the church exists not for members. Let me repeat that, that phrase. The church don't exist for its members. Who does it, who does a church, what does a church exist for? For the non-members. The whole reason for being a church is that we be a light for the world. We exist for the non-members. And our senior pastor have often reminded us that if we come to church here to book our sports hall, 
If you're a member, all right, your priority go all the way down. But if you bring a non-Christian friend, all right, your priority go all the way up. All right? That is why it's not like a club at all. So unlike a club where members are served, we serve the non-members. That is why we are not a club. Other people say that church is like a hospital. We come here because we are, we, we are wounded, whether wounded or sick in physically or even mentally, emotionally or socially. Now, what's the difference between a church and, and a hospital then? And let me tell you the difference here. In a hospital, people come and get healed and then you don't want to remain in the hospital, right? There's something wrong in you if you want to continue to say, tell the nurse, nurse, I don't want to leave because I love you here. There's something wrong with you if you do that, right? So in a hospital, when you are healed, uh, you know, you, you, you get discharged. But in a church, although in some sense it's like a hospital, but it's different from a hospital. Why? Because the patient, once they are healed, they remain and they become nurses and doctors. That's where it's different. You become the nurses and doctors to now heal the sick. So unlike a hospital where once we're healed, we will not return to it, we remain and become doctors and nurses, uh, tending to those sick and wounded. And this is going to happen this coming weekend at the Randy Clark. All right, we begin, God will begin to use us to be that channel of blessing, of seeing a need meet it, and seeing a hurt, you heal it. So people see the church as a concert, a school, a club, a hospital. Do you know some people see the church like a petrol station? You come here every weekend, like this Sunday here, come and get pumped up, you know, boo, right? Charge up and then go out and then start discharging. Uh. By the time Friday or Saturday comes, uh, you, you need petrol right, again, uh, right? And so pastors and leaders have uh, become pump attenders, you know. We just pump and pump and then go out and then get this and then come back again. So, yeah, in some sense, it is a petrol station. But in another sense, it's not. You know why? Because we cannot forever be getting pumped up and then go out and then discharge and then come back. Do you know God has called us to be palm attenders. All of us here, in this room here. That is why I say, turn to one another and say, you can be a cell leader. Why? Cell leaders are palm attenders. All right? So, unlike a petrol station, you know, we don't come here just to be charged up on the receiving end. We become what I call the chargers. We charge up people. And then some people treat the church like a shopping mall. There's consumer loyalty, right? But once, once I don't like what I see, I go to another shopping mall. And I pray that we will all not look at the church like a shopping mall because they will be looking at church like a consumer. And God has called us not to be the consumer, but rather maybe God is calling us to be a supplier maybe, right? Where we begin to learn how to give rather than receive. So church is not like a shopping mall, although many of you like the environment that you feel here but it's never meant to have that shopping mall feel. All right? So church, church is not a shopping mall. There, there are many other analogies. For example, some people say that you know, church is like a fire, fire station. You come to church because your life is on fire, you know? or your marriage is on fire. So all the leaders, are, are, you know, all the pastors, are like firemen, are dousing away a huge fire. Right? And then you never come back again until the next fire. See, that, that's a problem. If people, don't view, if people view church that way, like the blind man touching one aspect of it, they don't see the totality. You get what I'm saying here? You understand where I'm coming from? So it's so important to understand the idea of church. Do you know, in, in the midst of here, a few thousand people here in, in the UMC, you know, we, we many, by the way, running a church is hard work, you know. Why? Because we minister from the youngest to the oldest. Uh. We, we have ministry, what I call cradle to the grave, uh. We minister to people who like fast music, and then other people like slow music. Some like fast song, some like slow song, some like hot, some like cold. You can get a thousand opinions how a church will be run, you know. And I pray that, you know, one of the things that we need to learn is to recognize that a church has diverse interests. Huh? What I like may not be what somebody like, all right? And that is why we are all taught huh, to die to self every day. Right? I don't need what... I need some time. Though. I can give it to somebody else. So church is far more than what I've just tried to define just now. In fact, in, in the original, in the Greek word of the word church, which is translated in English, it translates from the Greek word called ecclesia. Now what is ecclesia? Ecclesia actually means assembly. So when, when the Apostle Paul wrote the church in Ephesus, 
The church in Smyrna, what does he mean? He's, what is meaning? What he means is that it's an assembly. Assembly or what? Assembly of people who love Jesus. That's what a church is. Church is not the building. Church is an assembly of God's people. In a recent trip to, uh, to Turkey, uh, just two weeks ago with my wife, we were on holiday there, we were visiting Ephesus, the ancient city of Ephesus. And uh, in, in that small tour group that we had, somebody asked the tour guide, he was a Muslim guide, he said, by the way, where is the church of Ephesus? In his mind, church means that steeple, yeah? with a cross. And very interestingly, this Muslim guy was very knowledgeable even about the Bible. He said, oh, you're, you mean the seven churches? Right? Then he said, you know, no, there's, there's no church, only assembly. He used the right word, assembly. He said, there's no physical building. When Apostle John, all right, John addressed the, uh, uh, the seven churches, it is talking about an assembly of Christians, of people who love God. There is no physical building. And I think that is a great idea. Church is not a building. Church is an assembly. And that was how in the book of Acts in the New Testament church, that people were meeting in, from home to home. They were meeting in homes. They were, they were sitting in circle. They were teaching one another. All right? They were ministering to one another. They were caring for one another, praying for one another in a circle. How did we become rows? Uh? Right? We became row because of the year 312 AD. Christians before 312 were persecuted, were hunted down, and nobody wanted to meet in a big group. They tried to meet in the temple courts here and there. But they were basically, the church meets in homes. They meet from, and they break bread in home. They eat together at home. And no one really, you know, want to showcase that I'm a Christian because you'll be persecuted. But on the year 312, the first emperor who became a Christian is Constantine. And from that day onward, it became popular to be Christians. And thousands of people become Christian. Guess what? They begin to make, make a, a, a construct huge buildings. If you go to Italy today, you, you see huge basilica. Basilica actually means buildings, all right? And they converted that to a church. And over time, bigger people begin to sit in row. And over time, I can't go into church history right now, but over time, you know, you become the audience. And the pastor becomes the performer. And we study the word. You don't have to study. I tell you what to do. And over time, you just become passive audience. You don't sit in circle anymore, holding each other to accountability. And we lost that in church history. And so interestingly, let me now, now come back to the core, what I'm trying to say here, is therefore, what is a church then? How do we see the elephant as a whole? Okay? Now, I want to bring you to a verse from Scripture. Philippians chapter 2 is in your, in your handout as well. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Why don't we read this aloud together? Everyone, read it together. One, two, go. But I think it is necessary to send back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Now, in this simple verse here, Apostle Paul showed to us three things that the church must be. He, he addressed Epaphroditus as a brother, he addressed Epaphroditus as a fellow worker, and then a fellow soldier. All these three things here tells you something about the church. The first thing is about the word brother. In other words, the church is a family. The church must be family, because when we enter into the kingdom of God, we are all brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen? All right? Turn to the person next to you and say, you're my brother, you're my sister. Can you do that right now? Affirm that in each other. You are part of my family. You are. We may have different skin color. It's okay, you know? We are still brothers and sisters in the Lord. Now, let me bring you to another text of Scripture from the book of Exodus chapter 18. It's up on the screen as well. Exodus chapter 18. Now, let us just read this passage, then I'll explain to you what I mean. All right, read it together. One, two, go. The next day... Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge? 
while all these people stand around you from morning till evening. Verse 15. Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will, whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Now, the context of this passage is this. Moses was taking three and a half million people around, three to three and a half million people around the desert. Now, three to three and a half million is a lot of people. 600,000 fighting fit men. Okay, you, you add up all their family members, it's about three to three and a half million. Now, part of Moses' role was to sit and the people coming to him to complain about issues, to seek advice, and he would sit there. And Jethro, his father-in-law, came to visit him one day. And he notices that Moses was sitting there all right, like every great man would do, and just invite people to come to him. And there was a long queue. In some sense, very much maybe like a government department taking numbers. Uh, right? And Jethro noticed that, wow, from morning to night, Moses was addressing the people one by one. Number one, oh, come on. Number two, uh, number 50, there's still about 1,000 numbers. No? And people were going home very angry. Why? Because by the time evening comes, they could not get to see Moses. Uh. And something clicked all right, uh, in, in uh, Jethro's mind, which I will tell you later. But the point is this. Moses is like a father to the people. He loves his people. He wants to minister to them. So, great heart. And that is why, you know, it's a family. It's like a family. God's people is like a big, huge family. Moses is like a father. Do you know family make time for one another? I'm sure you will love that. So your son, your, your daughters your husband, your wife, we make time for one another. Family do things together. When you come to a church, all right, this size here, we are told that we are family, right? Now, obviously, in a size like this, you can't really make time for one another in a meaningful way, right? Would you agree with me? Especially on a Sunday morning. If, if church on a Sunday is the only place you come to, right? No other place you go to. So every week you are here, now, let me describe to you a situation here. How many of you here come early to church? I mean, before 10 a.m. Don't put up your hand. Okay, but my estimate is that something like maybe 20, 30% 20, of the people are here on, on the dot. All right? So many of you come here like Russians, you know. Right? You come here, you know, like, like want to get in quickly. Why? Already started, ma. Uh, worse still is that, you know, pastor there shaking hands with you. Uh, yeah, not so nice, huh? So you faster a bit, lah. So you're coming like Russians, is it? And by the time you get in here, worship started, right? The only words you say to anybody is probably the pastor shaking your hand and the usher. Lah. And what do you say to them? Oh, hi, hi, hi. Hi is the only thing you say, you know. Or you, some of you may not even say anything because you've got a face like a lemon juice, maybe, a lemon, you know. Maybe you're going through a hard time, you know, in the morning, and so you come here with all the wound in your heart. Maybe, I don't know, right? Some of you don't want to say anything, but just look straight at me, you know, right? And so you, you walk into a church having not said anything to anybody yet, you know. So worship goes on, and uh, by the time the pastor in church comes, Pastor Jinong comes on here, and he says, now stand up before you sit down, okay? Say to five other people, uh, what did he say this morning? Uh, Jesus loves you, right? He said that, right? Jesus loves you with compassion, he said, you know. So you say to five people with three words each, uh, so how many words have you said to one another? Fifteen words to a Christian. Okay? And then, of course, now I'm up here. Like, there's no chance you can talk. I don't talk when I speak, all right? <laughs> and then, by the time, all right, I think in about 15 minutes, uh, this is going to happen, you know? Some of you are going to look at your watch already. It's a signal to the preacher, time's up. <laughs> all right? Why? Because you got lunch appointment. You're going to run out of this place because your friend is waiting for you. All right? Maybe many other appointments. I don't know, all right? And... And then you run out at the end, benediction given by the way, leave only after benediction. Your benediction is a blessing, okay? <laughs> so then, then you, you rush out again at Russians. And do you know the av average diet of words a Christian say to another Christian for the average churchgoer in the world today? Eh? And I think there are no more than 30, 40 words, you know. And then after this morning, all of you become submarine Christian. Boom, go inside, right? Submarine. You don't talk to any other Christian eh? until the next weekend. I hope this is not a UMC member, by the way, because many of you are in cell groups, all right? So, but in, in the typical church, many become submarine Christians. They go there, they don't talk to any other Christian. They engage with the world. That is why you come to petrol station, is it? You get pumped up. Why? Everything is discharged, you know. All right? And so, in some sense, the average church member, if, there's no, if you have no other activity except to attend a church a celebration like this, huh? 
No wonder you don't grow. Because we don't just grow through just hearing the word. You know how we grow? We grow by doing as well. Not only are hearers of the word, we are the doers of the word. In doing, our hearts are transformed. Now, who holds you accountable to doing? That is why we meet in small groups. It is in a small group that we hold each other accountable. You know, pastor said that last weekend. How are you doing this in your life? How can I pray for you that in order for you to do this? So we hold each other accountable. In fact, in a cell group, let me say this. It's a bit hard to backslide. Lah. Over here, if you stop coming to church, uh, if the church is the, celebration is the only thing that you do. When you don't come for three months, all I can say to you, oh, I haven't seen you for three months at all. But you already blacksided three months. Uh. But I tell you what, in a cell group, this is the most loving thing my cell member does to me. Uh. Whenever I don't come to cell group, I get a call already. Hello, how are you? Is there anything I can pray for you? Basically, whoever calls you from the cell group is saying that I love you. I'm concerned for you. All right. Are you in difficulty? Can we help you or not? Do you know it's like almost like pulling you back from backsliding, you know? That is why I say when you go to cell group, you're doing yourself a favor. You're not doing a cell leader a favor. You're not doing a cell member a favor. You're doing yourself a favor. Why? Because your cell leader and your cell member keep watch over you. In fact, in one of the scriptures from the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 14, it's in your notes, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, it says that, what then shall we say, brothers? Now, this is talking about an assembly of God's people. The meeting of disciples who love Jesus. So he says here, Apostle Paul, what then shall we say, brothers, when you come together, when you come together like this here, right? When you come together, everyone, what does everyone mean? Everyone. Right? Your neighbor sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you. Everyone, everyone, what does everyone do? Has a hymn. Okay, that's not a problem. You sang just now, right? So everyone has a hymn, so we sing. Then he goes on to say, everyone has a word of instruction. Meaning that I say to somebody about an instruction from the word of God. Now, this one becomes difficult. Like, you can't do this here, you know? Because you're rushing, my member rushing in, rushing out. So you don't have time to sit down with somebody or eyeball to eyeball somebody and say, this is the word of instruction to you. You don't have that. And then it goes on, a revelation. Everyone has a revelation. What's a revelation? Revelation is something God shows to you. It's an aha, it's an aha moment. Ah, oh, that's from God. This is what God is saying. Right? And then another one. Everyone has a tongue. And everyone has an interpretation. Okay? I have no time to go into that. You can, you can, you can do all that in your school or leadership moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the point is, where is the platform where all this takes place, which is actually an instruction from the Word of God? By the way, you can't do it here, no? Here is a great place to receive instruction, where the Word of God is preached. But where is the place where we exercise what an assembly of God's people can do? If you don't have any other place to do that, let me suggest to you a cell group. That is why in the cell group we sit in a circle. We don't sit in rows in the cell group. Any several seats in a row in a, in a home? I need to have a word with you, right? We all sit in a circle. Why? So that we can see your face. So that we can see whether you're happy, you're sad, whether you need a word of encouragement or even a word of rebuke. That's why we sit in a circle. And cell group is in the only place we sit in a circle. And I think it's very hard in this hall year to sit in a circle. Though. Impossible to do that. So we must have that platform of a small group, relationships. Now some of you here with that card in your hand right now, you say, no, I still don't want to be in a cell group. Fine. I will pray that God will convict you. But let me say this to you. There will come a day when you will need a cell group member. Now every time when I, when I, when I receive a call to go to the hospital to pray for somebody, one of the greatest thrill I have is that by the time I get to the hospital, a big group of people already there. You know who are these people? Cell members. They are already there ahead of time. They are already there caring for the people that God has called them to care. Who would you call at 2 a.m. in the morning if you are in trouble? Don't call the ghostbuster, right? Call your cell leader or cell members. We even have calls in the middle of the night, okay, where a cell member who is pregnant is about to give birth. 
all right? And the, the, for some reason, the husband was not around. It was a cell leader who drove his car, and the baby came out in the car. Let me tell you, that's life. You know, it's amazing that when I see, after that, you know, different ladies in the sago would just take time now to cook for, for, the, for the new mother. All right, I'll put the father benefit. Right? <laughs> and it would take time to do that, and somebody has fallen sick. I've seen cell members just taking turn to just take care of the children, take care. And I tell you, that is life. One of the saddest things that I have as a pastor is this, you know. I receive calls. I re we receive a lot of calls for help. And uh, someone will say, Pastor, can you come, you know, to, to, to minister to, to me in this area, to my father, to my all that, right? And I say, do you belong to a cell? They say, no. That is why the only person they can call when they're in trouble is their pastor. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't like to receive call from you. Eh? It's just I'm so sad that there's nobody else to call except your pastor or a church leader or an elder of the church. Eh? There's no one else in your life. Eh? And that to me is very sad because we are all called to be a family. So I pray that your, your phone from now on will be filled with numbers of people who love you, you know. Enough to go to you at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, and say, how can I help you? Uh? All right? But don't call yourself leader when you cannot sleep at night. Uh. <laughs> can you pray for me? I cannot sleep, you know. <laughs> be kind to yourself leader too, uh, right? The privilege of just having family at home. You know, my... my, my home was, was, was open to a cell group for many years. You know, the, the largest number of children at one time was 17 children in my cell group. Can you imagine what a madhouse 17 children are in a cell group? We have broken one sofa already. <laughs> and we told, my wife and I told each other, we cannot paint the house uh, for many years until they all grow up uh, because they all start writing on my wall, you know. <laughs> but on the very day when finally, you know, the... the for many years, the children have grown up, they've gone on in their life, and finally, you know, we're all adults already. My wife and I look at each other, it's time to paint our house. And then we look at the wall of our house. Those writings that we used to be very angry, always look at the kid like that, what you write on my wall. When I look at it, I begin to cry. Because these are reminders to us that our children have grown up. By the way, they are not my cell members' children, they are also my children, you know. Because you're family, man. You look after my children, it's like, look after your children, and I've seen them grown up. Do you know that war with all the writings is all worth it? Because they have grown up to be, to be children who love Jesus. And when finally, when we finally paint the wall, it was sad for me. They have all those drawings of the little kids on there. When I used to be so angry with them about it. was all worth it. And that is why I believe my home, my family was blessed, because for years I opened up my home where God is worshipped. And I pray that to, from this morning onwards, somebody will rush out now and say, I want to open up my home for cell group. Why? Because blessings. You see that? And so that's why we are a family. I can go on and on telling you, you know, story of, of blessings, just having family at home, right? The bigger family, the extended family at home. But church is a family. The second thing is that Apostle Paul addressed Apropoditus as a fellow worker. So that's what we call a, in a worker, it's, a, it's, it's like a corporation. So the church is a corporation. Let's read from Exodus chapter 18, verse 17. It says that, read aloud together, right? Why don't you go? Moses' father in law replied, What you are doing is not good. Let's read aloud, right? You and these people who come to you will only wear yourself out. This work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people representative before God and bring the disputes to Him. Teach them the decrees and the laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. And have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide for themselves, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God still commands you, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. 
Now, Jethro is a great father-in-law. He saw a situation. He said, Moses, if you continue doing what you're doing, seeing people from morning to night, you will die or burn out. And so Jethro here suggested a model of managing the people. And up to this day, we have now called this a Jethro principle. Now, what Jethro is suggesting is this. Moses, don't see everybody. What you need to do is to divide the people in this diagram here. You divide the people into into tens, into fifties, into hundreds, into thousands, and appoint a leader over each of these groupings. All the simple things that let the people underneath here, you do it. You only handle the most difficult things. So in this diagram here, the Jethro Principle, all right, if you look at it, in DUMC, right, right at the bottom rung is the cell leaders, is a group over tens. Zone leaders are groups of people over 50s. Zone pastors are people over hundreds. And district pastor like myself, all right, is a pastor over, you know, maybe a thousand. And so in this model here, like what Jethro say, all the simple things, all right, let the cell leader do it. And only when the cell leader can't do it, then let the zone leader do it. If zone leader can't do it, the zone pastor, you go up the rank. Now, this means that Moses don't have to do everything. So you translate that to modern day church, right? The senior pastor don't have to do everything. No wonder in so many churches today, they find it so hard to grow. Why? The pastor is burned out. He has no time to strategize. He has no time to pray. He has no time to lead the church. And therefore, you know, in this model here is a model of principle empowerment. It's right there. This is a corporate principle here, right? So let's not be afraid to say this is corporate. Do you know every good principle in the world today is of God? Even this principle? Now, some of you say, hey, excuse me, pastor, this diagram here looks like multi-level marketing. (laughs) And I'm not ashamed to say, yes, it is multi-level marketing. It is. But tell you what, the multi-MLM people, multi-level marketing people stole it from us. They stole it. It is century-old principle from the Old Testament. The church lost it. It's time to take it back. Amen? And let's not be afraid to say it's a corporate principle here. It is a management principle here that God instituted for the people of God. So what is the role of the leader? The role of the leader is not to go there and do the ministry, although it's important that we do that. The role of the leader is to train and equip the people to do the ministry. So as a pastor, whenever I do ministry, I bring people along with me. Why? Because I say, when I do, you watch. And over time, I do, you do together. And after a few weeks, then I watch, you do. Like, I give you feedback, how it's done. And that's how we develop. And that is why my heroes, like Pastor Daniel said, my heroes are the people standing up here just now. They are really, if you ask me, the frontline pastors. Uh, I'm so proud of them. Why? In the past, some of them will come to me, Pastor, visit people in hospital. I don't even know what scripture to open up to. No? But do you know today, they're walking like pastor, no? All right? They even can wear a coat and walk in there and look like pastor. And pray with confidence like a pastor. Why? Because we have empowered them. We are not afraid to empower them. The best thing I can do is to work myself out of a job. You know? I've got no more job to do. Wow, hallelujah, I'm very successful. No? Why? Because the people are doing it. And that is what uh, Jethro is trying to advocate. Therefore, the church is a corporation and let's not be afraid to say it. That is why I think God employed, or rather God put me in UMC, why engineer? Right? Engineer love process, you know. That's why I love the putting when I'm a, I love directing people and a director. So process one. And I think God has a place for engineers, all right? And we come in here and we begin. The, corp, the corporation is not foreign to me at all. Processes is not foreign to me at all. So when I come in, I was at home, very much at home. And I see God uses this principle over time, all right, to just, just bless the church. So the church is a family, the church is a corporation. And don't be afraid to say it, okay? And the church, the third thing is that a proprietor's address was addressed by, by Apostle Paul as a soldier. The word soldier is something that a military language or words are used over and over again in the Bible. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says, no one serving as a soldier get involved in civilian affairs. 
He wants to please his commanding officer. You see, the Christian now is portrayed as a soldier. He listens and obeys his commanding officer. Philemon, for example, says, uh, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Ephaia, our sister, the archipus, our fellow soldier. Notice the word soldier again. Now, when I, when, when I mention the word army, what comes to mind? When I mention the word soldier, what comes to mind? It comes to your mind, discipline, right? It comes to your mind, obedience. It comes to your mind that there's one direction we're going. Now, that is why in the church it's important that we must see ourselves as an army. It is not an army that uses force. It's an army of loving people, but very clear of the direction that the church is going. And therefore, you know, one of the roles of a leader in, in the church is to point the direction. It's to remind the church that our vision is building God's community and making known His glory, which is evangelism. The leader needs to remind, build up one another, evangelize. You need a commanding officer to do that. That's why the church must also be in an army. Apart from being a family, apart from being a corporation, you must be in an army. So in an army, for example, if a commanding officer was to ask, was to ask you to jump, what do you do? Do you say, why must jump? Do you do that to your commanding officer? You don't, right? What's the question you should be asking if your commanding officer says to you, jump, what must you say? What must, what must you ask? How high, that's right. How high do you want me to jump? You don't say, why? You obey, yes sir, I'll do that. Can you imagine in Moses, right? When the time comes, God says, break camp and go. And so Moses will send out all these officers, you know, break camp, break camp, break camp, right? Now can you imagine hundreds of people coming to Moses? Uh, why? My children are not fed yet, you know? All right? And give 101 excuses. Uh, it would be chaos, three and a half million people doing that. But here, in the, in, among the people of God, when Moses said, break camp, everybody break camp. Three and a half million, just move. There's a lot of people, no, three and a half million. Like the whole, almost the whole population, the Clang Valley, you know? Move. And everybody move. And that is why the army part is an important aspect of DUMC. Whenever the call is made, do you know the cell group comes to action? Many cell groups go to our Orang Asli settlement faithfully every week. And when it comes to relief work, not short of it, when there is a flood, all right, I remember years ago, there's a call made to cell group and cell group, all right, some cell group mobilize themselves and go. Sometimes mission. I remember one time in Kampong Damansara Dalam, where SS2 Mall is right now. It used to be a squatter area. I remember bringing PJ North 1 as a whole zone. We pray or walk the area. It was a squatter. Everywhere was squatters. And I remember one day, I saw a huge thick smoke coming from the distance. And I was told that was Kampong Damansara Dalam. And we had just pray or walk the place for six months. And we sprung into action. I have to cut the whole long story short, right? We mobilized cell groups to go in there every week, right? Because the people were moved to an abandoned police quarters. We went in there for one whole year. Every weekend, we go there, we paint up the whole place, we board up the, the window, the doors, and we brought them mattresses. We brought the children's school back for one whole year. How, how can we even do that? I can't do that. But we mobilized cell groups, uh, and they went in there week after week, uh, and they are all predominantly Malays. And at the end of the one year, when finally the place uh, was supposed to be moved to a new place, a new settlement for them, one day a very old machi came up to me. And she spoke in Basa to me and said, you know, why? Why do you all do all that? You know, the politicians and all the so-called orang besar, the big people, they have come in the very beginning. They only come, take picture, show a few things, then I, I, we don't see them anymore. But you people have been coming for one whole year. Why? Boy, I look at her. All I can say to her was, because God loves you. Jesus loves you. Do you know at the end, the, last, the very last weekend, they threw us a kanduri? And I believe that we have set in their mind a group of these people. The Christians all right, are good people. Amen? Now, how as a church can we even do that if we don't have people that we can mobilize quickly? Like, when the pastor say go, they all go. Uh. 
right? That is why I, it's so blessed to be part, you know, of the, uh, of the cell ministry because we can mobilize and mobilize people quickly yeah, through cell groups. Yeah. Just two, one story before I end, just two Fridays ago. By the way, I'm still a cell leader. I lead a group of young adults. The reason why I lead a group of young adults is because I want to feel young. So I lead young people. And I have come alive, by the way. Huh? Come alive in just, just being a cell leader all over again. And I love leading my young people. And if you remember reading in, uh, in the floodgates, the first issue of this year, or you heard a uh, testimony, uh, I think, end of last year, this testimony of Victoria Wong, who is a teacher, remember? And she gave herself two years, a young adult, graduated. I want to give two years of my life to teach for Malaysia. And Teach for Malaysia will send young adults, young, young teachers yeah, into the lower band schools. I mean, schools that are really, really, you know, down there, right, in terms of academic excellence. And Victoria Wong has been there for more than a year now. And she comes and shares with us some of the things that are happening uh, in, in, the, in the school. And she, she told us that, you know, one of the things I often have to do, because she teaches English, she wants to, to uh, you know, upgrade the level of English in these schools here. And this is school, predominantly, uh, most of them, you know, are, are the Malays in the rural areas. And she said, you know, their standard of English is so poor that I have to use extracts uh, of kindergarten Singapore syllabus uh, to teach the Form 1 and Form 2. Uh. So I make a lot of photocopies of these extracts of the workbook for them, two to three hundred students, and I teach them using kindergarten syllabus. And then she showed this letter, this letter which I photocopied. She said, let me show you the standard of English that my students have. She, so so I, I read this letter, you know, she said, Dear Miss Victoria, how are you? I hope you are the pink of health. I write this letter because I want to forgive me. I know you are angry with me. I know you want some reasons why you're angry with me. Remember this from two, huh? Firstly, my first reason is I naughty in your class. My second reason is I not focus when you teach. I can't focus when you teach because I can focus you give a lot of homework. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading to you verbatim, huh? Secondly, how I feel right. When you say I not love you, but I love you. I'm very sad when you say I not like you teach me. I hope you forgive me. Lastly, I will change all my naughty. <laughs> and I hope you read my letter. And when I read it, I mean, it, it's amusing. But I can see the heartache of Victoria, you know. She said, Pastor, I get so angry sometimes. You know? And then she said, in all this photocopying, you know, I will photocopy it, and then the students will pay me back a little at the time. Lah. You know, they're they are poor students, you see? And she said, Pastor, last two Fridays ago, she said, I got a problem. She said, What problem do you have? Said, I, I, I owe the photocopying person 600 ringgit. I don't have the money in my bank, you know. Do you know any rich people, no? I said, Then I look at her, I said, uh, Actually, I can afford 600, lah, but I don't want to. Eh? I just told her, I said, Tell what, uh, your cell group is a family, right? Why don't you check with your cell group? Pai uh? la. You know, Pai say means shy, uh, right? Don't want to ask. Uh, no, this is your family, you ask. Okay, so she very shyly sat down and shared with the whole group. Eh? Why? Show the letter as well. He said, I need 600. Lah. Okay, maybe you all can help me. Lah. Your family, ma? okay, all right. And I tell you what, to cut the whole, whole long story short, the cell members got together, all right? And by the end of the whole thing, eh, Victoria was in tears. You know. Why are you in tears? I counted about 1,000 there. And the cell member said, no need to pay me back. Just put it as a seed money. If you pay back, fine. If you don't pay back, never mind. Just put it as seed money. All right? and, then, and then Victoria began to say, hey, I got another project. You know, we're oh, getting excited already. You all start thinking already. I got another project. Is this two, 300 kids? Uh, they are from the really rural poor. They have no ambition. They say, they have no idea. They want to be doctor, lawyer. And they have no ambition. I am thinking of getting them to Kid Zania. You know Kid Zania at Curve? All right? Two, 300 of them, 80 bucks a person, you know? And then just take them there, expose them to give them inspiration to be something. Like. All right. Well, all the cell members go get excited. Yeah, that's a great project, all right? Anyway, it went on and on and say, you know, let's do something. So the cell group now mark up and say, and say, let's do something. And so I think I'm quite excited for them. And there's still that, that one year ahead of us. 
But I think getting exciting now, why? Because the cell now has come alive. Right? That we can do something. They talk about going there to do career talk. And now they're not going around to try to raise money now for this $80 per person, for 200 person, all right? And say, will you connect with student? All the students have written a letter. Now we have a chance now to reply back and write to every one of those single students and say, we love you, we care for you. Maybe they have never heard anyone saying that we love you before. Now, that's what a cell group can do. Just one cell group. Right? Isn't that an amazing, amazing thing when you fight, get fired up with the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ? Right? So if you want to be part of it, let me know later at the end of the service and say, I want to be part of that. I want to see a student all right, who is in the lower band school being inspired to be something. And so that is why, let me end by saying that when we begin to see that the church is a family, the church is a corporation, the church is an army, it makes sense. Let me tell you this, that we cannot swing too much towards the family side. You know why? Just focus family. You mean the elephant, touching the elephant, one, one aspect. Why? Because you become very inward looking, you know? You, be, you lose the world vision because you want to be family all the time. Uh. You want to have one particular seat there, nobody else can sit on my seat, you know? If you, somebody sits on my seat, I will get very angry, so you put reserve there, put your name there. Your family might have your favorite seats, is it? So if you just focus on family, you become inward looking, you lose the world vision. If you swing too much towards the corporate side, what happens? Just focus on corporate side. You become aloof. Everything process, process, process. You don't follow up. Cannot. So you become aloof, you lose our, we lose our personalness. If you focus too much on the army, go out, right? And die for Jesus. You actually die, lo. Right? There's no family to get back to. There's no process to help you in that fight. You just focus army. Fight, fight, fight. All right? Go out there, win the world for Jesus. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. But you just focus on one aspect, something goes wrong. So I think in the beauty of Scripture, it gives you the three picture of what a church is. The church is, a, number one, what is the church is? A family. Number two, the church is a corporation. And number three, Church is army. Amen? And I think that's a beautiful picture as to remind ourselves why we are a cell church. And the place to start is the cell group. And so those of you who are holding the card, you have not filled in yet, all right? Now, quickly, all right, just sneak in all right, your name, your contact number, your email address, your age group, all right? And if you don't want to put your age group, it's fine. I know some of you are sensitive about that. And... Uh, and then uh, which day of the cell group do you want to go to? Just stick it there and then we will assign your cell group then you'll give it a try, all right? Just give it a try. If you don't like it at the end, fine, all right? But give it a try and I think at least you can say, I've already tried, okay? And so if you can do that, just before you go, pass it on to the connectors, pass it on to the ushers and I think that will be great. That will be a great journey for you to find out your family. Amen?